Welcome to lecture eight of Network Security Fundamentals, where we will be talking about networking threats, assessment, and defenses. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to describe the different types of networking-based attacks, list different network assessment tools, explain how physical security defenses can be used. Threat actors place a high priority on targeting networks in their attacks. Exploiting a single network vulnerability can expose hundreds or thousands of devices. Attacks that target a network or a process, they actually are meant not only for compromising the network itself, but also compromising the laterally connected devices to that network as well. So we usually categorize those under interception attacks, layer two attacks, DNS attacks, distributed denial of service attacks, and malicious coding and scripting attacks. So let's start with talking about man in the middle attack. In a man in the middle attack, a threat actor is positioned in a communication between two parties. The goal of a man in the middle attack is to eavesdrop on the conversation or impersonate one of the parties. A typical man in the middle attack has two phases. The first phase is intercepting the traffic and the second phase is to decrypt the transmissions. Let's take a look at an example here. So looking at this case that we have over here, assume that a student, this guy, has been doing very poorly in their school. And all of a sudden, their teacher, let's say in this case, Alice, is sending a letter to the student's parent, Bob, asking them to show up for a parent's teacher conference and discuss everything. So when the mail arrives in the mailbox, what the student does is uh, picks it up, picks the mail from the mailbox, opens it up, forges the signature of the parents and declines the meeting and returns it back to Alice, which is our teacher in this case. Um, the other thing that it can, he can do is uh, he can go ahead and uh, recreate the letter and basically uh, from Alice tell parents that student is doing great in the school. So as you can see, with having access to um, to the uh, to the mailbox, this student, which kind of is creative as, as a bad actor, but also creative, right, can actually um, change the entire communication. A replay attack is a variation of a man in the middle attack, whereas the man in the middle attack alters and then sends a transmission immediately. A replay attack makes a copy of the legitimate transmission before sending it to the recipient. This copy is used later when the man in the middle attack or MITM replays the transmission. A specific type of replay attack is a session replay. And session replay, uh, basically it, it involves intercepting and using a session ID to impost, uh, impersonate a user. A session ID is a unique number, is a unique ID basically, that a web server assigns a specific user for the duration of the user's visit, which in this case we call it a session. Most servers create complex session IDs by using the date, time, and other properties of the visits, right? Uh, this can also include the um, IP address, right? The email address, username, user ID, role, privilege, and many, many uh, complementary uh, parts of information that can actually be incorporated into the session ID. So session ID usually is very difficult to be broken to. Uh, those are usually at least 128 bits in length and hashed using a secure hash function such as SHA-256 that we discussed before. Session IDs can be contained 
as a part of a URL extension by using hidden uh, fields of the URL in which the status sent to the client as part of the response and returned to the server as part of a form's hidden data or through cookies, even through cookies, you can have um, the session ID negotiated. Threat actors use several techniques for stealing in um, an active session ID, which the session is already in, uh, in, um, in progress, right? These include network attacks like um, hijacking and altering communication between two users, and actually the endpoint attacks, which is cross-site scripting, Trojans, malicious um, JavaScript coding, and so on and so forth. Sometime um, once a session ID has been stolen successfully, a threat actor can then impersonate the user and move from there, start compromising the rest of the network and even move laterally. Then we do have the man in the browser or MITB. Like an MITM attack, a man in the browser or MITB attack intercepts communication between parties to steal or manipulate the data. Uh, whereas an MITM attack occurs between two endpoints, such as between two laptops or a user's computer and a web server, and a man in the browser attack occurs between a browser and the underlying computer specifically, and man in the browser attack seeks to intercept and then manipulate the communication between the web browser and the security mechanism of such computer. An MITV attack usually begins with a Trojan infecting the computer and installing an extension into browser configuration so that the uh, open, as soon as the browser is being opened and uh, becomes active, that extension actually become active as well. When a user enters the URL of a site, the extension checks whether the site is targeted for attack. After the user signs into the website, the extension waits for a specific web page to be displayed in which the user enters information such as the account number and password for an online financial institution like a bank or uh, a Merrill Lynch account or, or a Schwab account or something like that. So when the user clicks the submit, the extension captures all data from the fields on the form and may even modify some of the entered data. The browser sends the data to the server which uh, performs a transaction, generates a receipt, and returns it to the browser. The malicious ex extension captures the receipt data and modifies it with the data the user originally entered so that it appears that a legitimate transaction has occurred and user has no way to know something has changed, right? Because everything happens in the underlying layer of communication. Threat actors gain several advantages in an MITV attack. Most MITV attacks are distributed through Trojan uh, browser extensions, which provides a valid function to the user, but also installs the MITV malware, making it difficult to recognize that malicious code has been installed. Because MITV malware selects websites to target, an infected MITV browser might remain dormant for months until triggered by the user uh, visiting a targeted website because those specific targeted websites are the ones that actually are gonna be attacked. MITV software resides exclusively within the web browser, making it difficult for a standard anti-malware software to detect it. So, when it comes to layer two attacks, we need to talk a little bit about the history, right? In 1978, the International Organization of Standardization, or ISO, released a set of specifications to describe how the similar computers could be connected uh, together on a network. The ISO demonstrated that what happens on a network device when sending or receiving traffic can be best understood by portraying this transfer as a series of related steps. 
the ISO called this work the Open System Interconnection or OSI. The OSI reference model, right? After the revision in 1983, the OSI reference model is still in use today. The key to the uh, OSI reference model are the layers. The model separates networking steps into a series of seven layers. With each layer, different networking tasks are performed that co uh, cooperate with the task in the layers immediately above and below. Each layer in the sending device corresponds to the same layer in the receiving device. And basically, whatever this layer is um, encapsulating, the other layer on the other side is uh, decapsulating and vice versa. The TCP IP model also is being very well explained using the uh, using the model that we just discussed, the uh, OSI model. In that model, if you want to look from the bottom and come up, we start with physical li uh, layer, then data link layer, which is layer two. Layer three is network. Layer four is transport. Layer five is session. Six is presentation. And seven is application layer. There are many mnemonics to memorize that, some of which are, uh, please do not... Um, touch uh, Sam's pet alligator. And with that, you can remember it from the bottom to top. Um, or you can just look up internet for other versions of mnemonics that people usually uh, use for this. Layer two, the data link layer is responsible for dividing the data into packets. This is a compromise that can happen at layer two and that's all based on compromising the packets, which are um, small pieces of information, right? And if the packets gets compromised, then the entire communication can be compromised. So if you wanna wrap this, layer two of the OSI model is particularly weak in this regard and is a frequent target for the, uh, for the threat actors. Layer two or the data link layer is responsible for dividing data into packets along with error detection and correction. That's key there. And layer two performs physical addressing and data framing and error detection and handling of the media is gonna happen in this layer. So um, address resolution protocol poisoning is one of the attacks that can easily happen here. The TCP IP protocol suit requires that logical internet protocol or IP addresses be assigned to each device on a network. These addresses can be changed as necessary. However, an Ethernet LAN uses the physical media access control or MAC address that is permanently burnt into the network interface card, which we also call it a NIC. And this is, this is what is needed for communication. So the association between IP address and physical address, MAC address, is what makes the communication happening. A device using TCP IP on an Ethernet network can find the MAC address of another endpoint based on the IP address with the ARP or address resolution protocol. If the IP address for an endpoint is known, but the MAC address is not, the sending endpoint delivers an ARP packet to all devices on the network that in effect says, if this is your IP address, send me your MAC address. So basically searching for who has the MAC address associated with the IP address. The endpoint with the IP address sends back a packet with MAC address so the packet can be correctly addressed. The IP address and the corresponding MAC address are stored in an ARP cache for future reference. In addition, all other endpoints that hear the ARP replay also cache the same data. Threat actors though, uh, take advantage of a MAC address stored in a software ARP cache 
to change the data so that an IP address points to a different device. This attack is known as ARP poisoning and uses a spoofing, which is deceiving by impersonating another's identity. This, this type of attacks, the spoofing and um, uh, spoofing attacks have been very much uh, famous during the last, let's say, decade. But now with the newer technologies, they can be actually easily addressed. Besides ARP poisoning, other attacks manipulate MAC address through spoofing. Um, the, the target for these attacks is, is a network switch. A network switch, let's talk about the technology first. A network switch is a device that connects network devices and unlike some other network devices, has a degree of intelligence. It operates at the layer two data link layer and it can also operate at layer three, right? The network layer. Operating at the layer two data link layer, a switch can learn which device is connected to each of its ports. And uh, it does so by examining the MAC address of the packets it retrieves and observes at which of the switches port that packet has actually arrived at. It then associates the port with the MAC address of the device that has been um, connected to that port, storing the information in a MAC address table. The switch then knows on which port to forward packets intended for that specific device. Two common attacks involving spoofing MAC addresses on a switch are MAC cloning and MAC flooding. In a MAC cloning attack, threat actors discover a valid MAC address of a device connected to a switch. They spoof the MAC address on their device and send the packet onto the network. The switch then changes its MAC address table to reflect a new association of the MAC address with the port to which the attacker's device is now connected. Then all packets intended for the victim's device will be sent to the attacker's device. A MAC flooding attack is another attack based on spoofing. MAC cloning and the MAC address table of a switch are basically what uh, are the targets for the MAC flooding attack. A threat actor overflows the switch with Ethernet packets that have been spoofed so that every packet contains a different source of MAC address, each appearing to come from a different endpoint. This can quickly consume all the memory, which in this case we call it addressable memory or CAM, that's the content addressable memory, for the MAC address table. So this way, every memory which is um, available to you as, um, as to work for uh, MAC addressing and all that is now gonna be uh, flooded and overused and therefore you don't have that memory available anymore. The predecessor to today's internet was the network um, ARPANET. This network was complemented and finalized in about 1969 and used a 50 kilobits per second connection to link together single computers located at four sites, which back then it was uh, University of California in Los Angeles, uh, the Stanford Research Institute, and uh, the University of California at Santa Barbara, and the University of Utah. The goal was to reference the computers, right? So um, each was assigned an identification number, which basically IP addresses were not in, um, introduced back then before the, actually they tried to solve this problem. However, as computers were added to the network, it became more difficult for people to accurately recall the identification number for each computer. 
The networks needed a naming system that would assign computers both numeric addresses and friendlier human-related names that can be actually memorized. So in the early 1970s, each computer site began to assign simple names to network devices and to manage its own host table uh, that map name to the computers. However, because each site attempted to maintain its own local host table, inconsistency developed between the four sites. A standard master host table um, that could be downloaded to each site was then created to address the issue. When TCP IP was developed, the host table concept expanded to a hierarchical name system matching computer names and numbers known as the domain name system. So domain name system is the basis for domain name resolution of names to IP addresses used today. So basically it helps transfer uh, translating IP addresses to the names and vice versa. Because of the important role in that DNS plays, it is the focus of attacks. Like ARP poisoning, a DNS-based attack substitutes a DNS address so that the computer is silently redirected to a different device. A successful DNS attack has two consequences, URL direct redirection and domain reputation. The goal of DNS attack is usually a URL redirection. Instead of users reaching their intended site, they instead are redirected to an other site. The site is often fictitious, one that looks identical to a bank or, uh, or a Facebook page or an Instagram uh, login page and such, uh, to which users get fooled and then they enter their username, password, credit card number, or any type of information that the attacker is meaning to collect. The threat actors at the fictitious site capture and use the confidential information. When it comes to domain reputation, online algorithms are continually uh, evaluating the reputation of a website. Also domains are being evaluated, email services and other, other online services are being evaluated as such. Consider email reputation because every email message can be traced to an IP address and IP address gain and IP reputation based on past incidents, an email service that has sent spam or unwanted bulk email earns a low reputation score. An email service might reject email messages with low reputation scores, or even it may deliver them straight to the junk folder. Similar to an IP uh, reputation, domain reputation can identify a domain used for uh, distributing malware or uh, launching attacks. A company's co competition could hire a threat actor to use a DNS attack that earns the company a low domain reputation score, thus affecting the sales and affecting the marketing emails actually being able to reach to the destination. So next type of attack we wanna discuss under DNS attacks or DNS poisoning. Similar to ARP poisoning, DNS poisoning modifies a local lookup table on a device to point to a different domain. Usually, the alternative domain points to a malicious DNS server controlled by a threat actor. The DNS server redirects traffic to a website designed to steal user information or infect the device with malware. DNS poisoning on the local device involves modifying the local host table. TCP IP still uses host tables stored on the local device. When a user enters a symbolic name, TCP IP first checks the local host table to find any entry. If no entry exists, it uses external DNS system. 
Attackers can target a local host file to create new entries that redirect user to a fraudulent site. This type of attacks have been very common lately. And actually what I have noticed is those who learn cybersecurity have a good tendency to start with practicing those type of attacks. If you gain access to a local host file on a, on a system, then you can easily change the DNS and uh, redirect the users to the addresses you like them to be redirected to. Now let's talk about DNS hijacking. Whereas DNS poisoning attempts to modify the local device host file, DNS hijacking is intended to infect an external DNS server with IP addresses that point to a malicious site. DNS hijacking has the advantage of redirecting all users accessing the server. Instead of attempting to break into a DNS server to change its contents, attackers use a more basic approach. Because DNS servers exchange information among themselves, known as zone transfers, attackers attempt to exploit a protocol flaw and convince the authentic, authentic DNS server to accept fraudulent DNS entries sent from the attacker's DNS server. If the DNS server does not correctly validate DNS responses to ensure they have come from an um, authoritative source, it stores the fraudulent entries locally and um, serves them to all the users, spreading them to the DNS servers. The steps in a DNS poisoning attack from attackers who have domain name already in their hand as shown on this slide. So first, the attacker sends a request to a valid DNS server asking it to resolve the name www. let's say evil.net. Because the valid DNS server does not know the address, it asks the responsible name server, which is the attacker's ns.evil.net for the address. The name server ns.evil.net sends the address of not only www.evil.net, but also all of its records, which is called a zone transfer, and you can see it happening here, right? Back to the DNS server, which then in this case, it's going to accept it because it's going to be considered a, a valid zone transfer. Any request to the devil DNS server will now respond with the fraudulent addresses entered by this attacker in this case. Suppose Gabe is having a conversation with Cora in a coffee shop when a flash mob of friends descends upon them and all talk to Gabe at the same time. He could not continue his conversation with Cora because he's overwhelmed by the number of people talking to him at the same time. In a similar fashion, a technology-based denial of service or DOS attack bombards a system with bogus requests, overwhelming the system so that it cannot respond to legitimate requests. DOS attacks today are distributed denial of service or DDoS attacks. Instead of only one source making bogus requests, a DDoS involves hundreds, thousands, or even millions of sources producing a torrent of fake requests and therefore bringing the server down. The devices participating in a DDoS attack are infected and controlled by threat actors so that users are completely unaware that their endpoints are actually part of a DDoS attack. And as we discussed before, uh, you know that uh, this can happen through injecting a malware or uh, a tro uh, any kind of um, Trojan into the computer, so turning them into a botnet or a zombie net. So 
Let's start talking about malicious coding and scripting attacks. Several successful network attacks come from malicious software code and scripts. These attacks use PowerShell, Visual Basic for applications, the coding language, Python, and Linux or Unix bashes, and, um, and the tools as such. So PowerShell as a task automation and configuration management framework from Microsoft. Initially, PowerShell was a Microsoft Windows component known as Windows PowerShell and was built on the Windows.NET framework, which is a developer platform that can be used to write applications in a specific programming languages all the way back in 2016. So, it was updated and released both as an open source and a cross-platform product running on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux platforms. So if you have PowerShell um, interface, you can run it on any of the platforms that was just mentioned. Administrative tasks in PowerShell are performed by commandlets which are specialized .NET classes that implement a specific operation. PowerShell provider gives access to data in the data repository, such as the file system or Windows registry. Users and developers can create and add their own commandlets to PowerShell. PowerShell also provides a hosting application programming interface or API so the PowerShell runtime can even be embedded inside other applications. On Microsoft Windows platform, PowerShell has full access to a range of operating system components and APIs. It can run locally on an endpoint or uh, across a network accessing other endpoint devices. The power and reach of PowerShell makes it a prime target for the threat actors. PowerShell allows attackers to inject code from the PowerShell environment into other processes without first storing any malicious code on the hard drive. Commands can then be executed while bypassing the security protection and leave no evidence behind. PowerShell can also be configured so that its commands are not detected by anti-malware running on the computer. Because most applications flag PowerShell as a trusted application, its actions are rarely scrutinized. One recent attack illustrates how threat actor can use PowerShell. The attack has started with a phishing email containing the subject line urgent and an Excel attachment with a malicious embedded script. Once the user opened the attachment and approved the script to run um, on the computer, basically approving the active content, it decrypted and executed a PowerShell script. The script ran with the PowerShell parameters execution policy bypass, which means allow the PowerShell script to run despite any system restrictions. And uh, Windows, uh, Windows style hidden, which basically uh, runs the script quietly without any notification to the user. And no profile, which uh, does not load the system's custom PowerShell environment at all. And with that simple steps in the attack, with that simple three um, parameters set to active in the attack, the attack successfully happened. Visual Basic for Applications, or VBA, is an event-driven Microsoft programming language. VBA allows developers and users to automate processes that normally would take multiple steps or levels of steps. It can be used to control many tasks of the host application, including manipulating user interface features such as toolbars, menus, forms, and <coughs> dialog boxes. 
excuse me. VBA is built into most Microsoft Office applications like Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and such. For Windows uh, and Apple macOS platforms, um, both have the uh, VBA embedded in. So it's, it's not only for the Windows itself, it's also is for the Mac platform. It also includes in select non-Microsoft products such as AutoCAD, CorelDRAW, uh, LibreOffice, and such. VBA can even control one application from another application using object linking and embedding or OLE. For example, VBA can automatically create a Microsoft Word report from a data in a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. VBA is most often used to create macros. A macro is a series of instructions that can be grouped together as a single command. Macros are used to automate a complex task or a repeated series of tasks. Those are generally written using VBA. And those are stored within the user document, such as in the Excel file or worksheet or in a Word file and such. And those can be launched automatically when the document itself is opened. Although macros date back to oof, late 90s, they continue to be the key attack vector. Microsoft has reported that 98% of all Office targeted threats are a result of macro-based malwares. And it has war warranted users that if they don't look into this vulnerability, they're gonna be in big problem. So due to the impact of macro malware, Microsoft has implemented several protections. Protected view, trusted document, and trusted locations. Protected view is a read-only mode for an office file in which most editing functions are disabled and macros cannot run. When opened, files will be displayed um, as, as in a protected view, and there's going to be a warning message that... Uh, these files are from internet sites, so potentially unsafe location or another user's OneDrive or something like that, and uh, warns the users that the macros are disabled. A trusted document is a file that contains active content that can open without warning. Users can access the Office Trust Center to designate files as a trust as trusted file. However, files open from an unsafe location cannot be designated as a trusted document. A system administrator can also turn off the ability to designate a trusted document. When it comes to trusted locations, files retrieved from a trusted location can be designated as safe and open in a standard rather than protected view. It is recommended that if a user trusts a file that contains active content, it should be moved to a trusted location instead of changing the default trust center setting to allow the macros happening. So only files which are moved to a trusted location can be executed without warning. Python is a popular programming language that can run on several operating system platforms. Python syntax allows programmers to write code that take fewer lines than in other programming languages, such as Java or C++. Python also supports object-oriented programming. It has a large standard library in which developers can use routines created by other developers. So nowadays, um, there are a lot of talks about Python and how powerful and widespreadly used as Python in today's industry. There are several best practices to follow when using Python so that the code 
does not contain vulnerabilities. These include using latest version of Python, staying current on vulnerabilities within Python, being careful when uh, formatting strings in Python and downloading only vetted Python libraries. A library is actually a collection of functions and methods that can perform actions so that the programmer does not have to write the code for uh, those, those, uh, those steps themselves. A bash is the command language interpreter called the shell for Linux Unix operating system. Bash scripting is using bash to create a script, which the script itself is essentially the same as a program, but it is interpreted and executed without the need for, for the script to first be compiled into machine language. Exploits have taken advantage of the vulnerabilities in Bash. For example, one vulnerability allowed attackers to remotely attack a malicious executable file to a variable, which is a value that changes, right? That is executed when the Bash is invoked itself. So it's very important to understand these vulnerabilities. Now, let's do a quick knowledge activity. So in which type of attack is the threat actor positioned between two parties and alters the transmission to eavesdrop or impersonate one of the parties? The correct answer is man in the middle attack. Okay. Let's talk about the tools for assessment and defense now. Now that we talked about threats and possible um, threat actors, uh, we need to know what tools we can use to assess the threats and defend against the threats. Several assessment tools determine the strength of a network. Other tools can be used to create a stronger network defense. Both type of tools can be categorized into network reconnaissance and discovery tools, Linux file manipulation tools, scripting tools, and packet capture and replay tools. So some network rec uh, reconnaissance and discovery tools are command line utilities that are part of multiple operating systems, sometimes with slight variation in their names or different uh, switches or parameters while others function under only one single OS. So some of the tools are listed here. You can see the name of the tools and uh, the source or operating system, the source that they're coming from, and a short uh, description on these network reconnaissance tools. Also over here, we have uh, Linux file manipulation tools listed. So you can see the file, the tools that are being used in the Linux text files are uh, basically a fundamental element in the Linux operating system because virtually all configuration files in the Linux are text files. Changing the configuration of a security application involves modifying the text configuration file. Thus, managing Linux security applications and uh, operating system itself demands excellent text manipulation skills, which uh, over here, you can see several Linux text file manipulation tools that are uh, part of the Linux operating system by default. Uh, tools like head, tails, cat, rep, CH mode and logger are uh, the most commonly used ones on a Linux environment. Scripting tools are used to create a script that facilitate tasks. PowerShell is one of the most powerful scripting tools and Python can also be used to create scripts. Scripts can also be created when using secure shell or SSH that we discussed before. This one is used to access uh, remote computers. Another tool that supports the scripting is OpenSSL, a cryptography library that offers open source application of the TLS protocol. It was first released in about 1998 
and is uh, available for Linux, Windows, and Mac OS platforms. OpenSSL allows users to perform various SSL-related tasks, including CSR, certificate signing request, if you remember we discussed it in the previous lectures, private key generation, and SSL certificate installation. Of course, when you are talking about security tools, you have not done it completely if you don't talk about packet capture and replay tools. Collecting and analyzing data packets that cross a network can provide valuable information. Packet analysis typically examines the entire contents of the packet, which consists of the header information and the payload. However, because all information needed is rarely contained in a single packet, packet analysis must examine multiple packets. Often hundreds or thousands of packets are needed to be uh, evaluated and analyzed to get a meaningful information out of a network. Packet analysis can also be used extensively for security. It can detect unusual behavior, such as higher number of DNS responses, for example, that could indicate the presence of a malware, uh, search for unusual domains or IP address endpoints, and uh, discover regular um, connections like beacons to a threat actor's command and control center, a CNC server, right? Those are, those are what you can easily detect by using packet capture. Some famous tools, um, let's start with Wireshark. That's the most commonly known and the most popular one. Uh, Wireshark is a popular graphical user interface packet capture and analysis tool. And um, the other one is TCP dump, which is a command line packet analyzer. It displays TCP IP packets and other uh, packets being transmitted or received over a network. It runs on Unix and Linux operating systems, and various uh, uh, forks of it are available for Windows computers. However, the output from TCP dump can be uh, voluminous and uh, difficult to parse. TCP replay is a tool for editing packets and then replaying the packets back onto the network to observe their uh, behavior, which uh, which is usually used in conjunction with TCP dump. So what you see here is uh, an example of Wireshark uh, interface. As you can see, you have the packets captured information on the top and you select each one and uh, uh, you're gonna see uh, associated information to that packet. Let's do a knowledge check. Which of the following is a graphical user interface tool that it used to capture and analyze packets? The correct answer is Wireshark. So in the last portion of this lecture, we wanna discuss physical security. An obvious but often overlooked consideration when defending a network is physical security. Preventing a threat actor from physically accessing the network is as important as preventing the attacker from accessing it remotely. Physical security controls include external perimeter defense, internal perimeter defense, and computer hardware security. Some organizations use industrial camouflage in an attempt to make the physical uh, presence of a building as nondescript as possible, so that to a casual viewer, the building does not look like it houses anything important. When camouflage is not possible, external perimeter defense must be used. External perimeter defense are designed to restrict access to the areas in which equipment is located. This type of defense includes barriers, personnel, and sensors. Different types of passive barriers can restrict people or vehicles from entering 
a secure area. Fencing is usually a tall, permanent structure to keep out unauthorized personnel. It is usually um, accompanied by signage that explains the area is restricted and proper lightening so that the area can be viewed after dark. However, standard chain link fencing offers limited security because it can easily be circumvented by climbing over it or cutting the links. Most modern perimeter securities consist of a fence equipped with other deterrents such as those uh, come with the uh, electricity um, or uh, come with any kind of um, advanced deterrent associated with those. Whereas barriers act as passive devices to restrict access, personnel are considered um, active security elements. Unlike passive devices, personnel can differentiate between an intruder and someone looking for or for a lost pet and then decide when it's necessary to take appropriate action. Human security guards who patrol and monitor restricted areas are most often used as an active security defense. In settings that require a higher level of protection, two security guards may be required. This prevents one security guard who has been compromised, let's say through bribery threats or other means of uh, coercion from participating in an attack, such as allowing malicious actors entering through a, a locked door. Using two security guards is called 2% integrity control. Um, some guards are responsible for monitoring activity captured by video surveillance. And um, basically, uh, these are going to be uh, sitting in a room which is being fed by a CCTV or a closed circuit TV and monitoring uh, the, the, the feed that comes in. Some CCTV cameras are uh, fixed in a single position pointed at a door or a hallway, while other cameras resemble a small dome and allow guards to move the cameras 360 degrees for a full panoramic view. High-end video surveillance cameras only record when they detect movement, which basically means they are motion recognizing cameras, while others uh, can identify a suspicious object, such as a backpack left in the chair, uh, or 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 maybe sound and uh, alert uh, for for object detection. Increasingly, drones, also called uh, unmanned aerial vehicles or UAVs, include cameras for monitoring activities and have been extensively uh, used in physical security and monitoring. Um. Other thing that um, lately is uh, is becoming a trend, especially um, the other day in San Jose, I noticed a couple of those in Valley Fair are the robot sentries, which uh, patrol and use CCTV with object detection um, and are increasingly, increasingly being used in public areas. Uh, and then um, you also can rely on a receptionist, which, uh, which is who staffs the public reception area and can also provide the level of active security. Public uh, reception areas are an often overlooked risk. Once visitors are in the re uh, reception area, they're already inside the facility beyond external barriers. The receptionist duty should, uh, should be to observe and uh, interact appropriately with the public so that potential malicious actors feel they are always being observed. This means receptionists should not have additional clerical duties beyond maintaining visitor log or uh, recording either paper or electronic of those individuals granted access. Otherwise, the receptionist will be distracted from their primary duty. With uh, human personnel, an incident may occur during um, a lapse of attention by a security guard. To supplement the work of security guard, sensors can be placed in strategic locations to alert guards by 
generating an audible or visual alarm of an unexpected or unusual action to, uh, to back up the human personnel. Internal physical security controls, let's see what those are. External perimeter defenses are designed to keep an intruder from entering uh, a campus building or, or, or any other area. If unauthorized personnel defeat external perimeter defenses, they should next face internal physical access security, such as locks, uh, secure areas, and protected cable distributions or such. In addition, fire suppression is considered an internal physical security. Um, let's talk about locks. Uh, a variety of locks can restrict access. You have uh, physical locks that require key or other device to open doors or cabinets, and they're most common type of physical locks that you can see those everywhere. However, physical locks that use a key can be compromised if the keys are lost, or stolen, or duplicated. Key distributed to multiple users to access a single locked door increases the risk of the key being compromised. A more secure option is to use an electronic lock. Um, electronic locks use, excuse me, electronic locks usually um, have buttons that must be pushed in the proper sequence to open the door or just entering a password. An electronic lock can also be programmed to maintain a record of when the door was opened and by which code and um, to, uh, to allow someone's code to be valid only at the specific times and uh, many, many different types of um, combinations of security policies can be enforced through those. Growing in popularity are smart locks that use a smartphone that sends a code via wireless Bluetooth or, um, or the wireless Wi-Fi uh, access points to open the door. And also fingerprint locks that have a pad that can scan the fingerprint. Also retina scanner locks are out there that can actually um, address uh, the issue of uh, entry control. So in combat areas, a demilitarized zone or a DMZ separates two uh, warring nations. Like you have a DMZ between North and South Korea, right? In cybersecurity, a DMZ is likewise an area that separates threat actors from defenders. Also, they call it a physical air gap. Enterprises often have DMZs or secure areas in buildings or offices to separate the secure facilities from unknown and potentially hostile uh, outsiders. Before electronic security was available, uh, vestibules with uh, two locked doors controlled access to sensitive areas. Actually, we're talking about such um, such a man trap, right? So you have two doors uh, and in between is where a hostile environment and inner environment get commingled, right? And uh, basically um, you, you can have a good control over there. So if I wanna go back to the man trap, a modern man trap is designed as an air gap to separate non-secure areas from a secure area. A man trap device monitors and controls two interlocking doors to a vestibule. As, as you can see on this slide, uh, when in operation, only one door can be opened at any time. You cannot have both of the doors opened at the same time. This creates a physical air gap or um, the absence of any type of uh, connection between the areas can improve security. Man traps are used in high security areas where only authorized personnel can enter, such as cash handling areas or research laboratories and such. Uh, another area that must be secured is the data center that houses the on-prem network, your servers, storage equipment, and all that, because um, network equipment and servers in a data center generate large amount of heat a hot aisle, cold aisle layout can reduce the heat by managing the airflow. 
in a data center using a hot aisle, cold aisle layout, the server racks are arranged in uh, alternating rows with cold air intake facing one direction and the hot air exhaust facing the other direction to make sure that uh, you do have uh, physical security provided for the servers because uh, if you have excessive amount of heat, your servers physically are going to be damaged. So have it in mind that you also want to think about the uh, hot aisle, cold aisle when it comes to designing a physical security. So uh, protected cable distribution, uh, we talk about the fact that cable conduits are hollow tubes that carry copper or wire fiber optic cables as, um, as usual inside and protect those from um, outside elements. A protected cable distribution is a system of cable conduits used to protect classified information that is being transmitted between two secure areas. PDS is a standard created by the US Department of Defense or DOD. Two types of PDSs are commonly used. A hardened carrier PDS, um, the data cables are installed in a conduit constructed of a specific electrical uh, metallic tubing or a similar material. All the connections between segments are permanently sealed with welds or special sealants. And if the hardened carrier PDS is buried underground, such as running between buildings, the carrier containing the cables must be um, encased in concrete and any uh, manhole covers that give access to the PDS must be locked down. A hardened carrier PDS must be visually inspected on a regular basis to uh, find any kind of possibility of breach. An alternative to hardened carrier PDS is an alarmed carrier PDS. And this type of PDS, the carrier system is deployed with specialized optical fibers and the conduit that can sense uh, acoustic vibrations that occur when an intruder attempts to gain access to the cables, which triggers an alarm. The advantage of an alarmed carrier PDS are that if provided, uh, uh, installed properly, it, they can provide uh, continuous monitoring. They can eliminate the need of periodic visual inspections, and they can allow the carrier to be hidden above the ceiling or below the floor and eliminate the need for welding or um, ceiling connections or um, basically going down into uh, underground and being cemented. So damage inflicted as a result of a fire as a constant threat to persons as well as properties and as well as computer systems. Fire suppression includes attempts to reduce the impact of the fire, right? So in a data center that contains electronic equipment, using water or a handheld fire extinguisher is not recommended because it can contaminate the equipment. Instead, stationary fire suppression systems are integrated into the building's infrastructure and release um, fire suppressant. Uh, the systems can be classified as dry chemical systems that uh, disperse a fine dry powder over the fire or clean agent systems that do not harm people, documents, or electrical equipment in the room. Uh, <clears throat> clean agents can uh, extinguish a fire by reducing heat, removing or isolating oxygen or inhibiting the chemical reaction. Now let's uh, go ahead and talk about the computer hardware security, which is the last piece that we're gonna discuss about in this physical security section. Uh, computer hardware security is the physical security that specifically involves protecting endpoint hardware, such as laptops that can easily be stolen. Most portable devices, as well as many expensive computer monitors, have a special steel bracket uh, security slot, I mean, let me just show you this over here, right? This is what we're talking about. 
uh, the secure slot can be locked and then through a cable, which is difficult to be uh, cut or damaged, uh, this, uh, this device can be fixed into a table or into a wall of an, uh, a data center or, or an office. So all in all together, uh, remember that the importance of the physical security, if not uh, equal to digital security is not less than that. It, this usually is the, the easiest for them to steal your physical hard drive rather than trying to break into it. Now let's do a knowledge check activity. What can be used to secure electronic devices from electromagnetic spying and shielding them? And the correct answer is C, Faraday cage. So in this lecture, we reviewed and we discussed the following. We said some attacks are uh, designed to intercept network communications. We talked about the man in the middle and replay attacks. Uh, we said some types of attacks inject uh, poison into a normal network process to facilitate an attack. We talked about DNS poisoning and we said it modifies a local a lookup table on a device to point to a different domain, which is usually a malicious DNS server controlled by a threat actor that will redirect traffic to a website designed to steal users' information or infect the device with malware. We also discussed that several successful network attacks come from malicious software code and scripts. We said there are several different assessment tools for determining the strength of the network, and we actually introduced some. We said collecting and analyzing data packets that cross a network can provide a wealth of valuable information. We said an often overlooked consideration when defending a network is physical security, which is preventing a threat actor from physically accessing a network is as important as preventing the attacker from accessing it remotely or digitally. While barriers act as passive devices to restrict access, personnel are considered active security elements. In the event that unauthorized personnel defeat external perimeter defenses, they should then face internal physical access security. And finally, a demilitarized zone on the DMZ was introduced, which is an area that separates threat actors from defenders, also called physical air gap. We also looked into a man trap. With that being said, we close this presentation and end this lecture.